Well, hello and welcome, folks. My name is Celeste Harrison, and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that everyone should be able to safely explore the wonders of our world. So our Explorer Classroom events connect students from all around the world with National Geographic Explorers, who are amazing scientists, filmmakers, adventurers, researchers, photographers, and, and so much more. You name it, we've got it. For short lessons and extended Q&As here in the Explorer Classroom. This summer break, we have these events every Wednesday and Thursday afternoon, as well as some other cool events for older students that you can find at natgeoed.org slash Explorer Classroom. And for today, we're very, very lucky to have Phoebe Griffith joining us. Phoebe is a conservationist and a zoologist specializing in crocodilians. She's researching the gharial crocodilian, which I'm hoping I'm pronouncing right, and which is critically endangered. Her work is based in Nepal, where she tracks the movements and survival of these amazing creatures. Before we learn all about crocs, I'd like to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by a bunch of really wonderful students today. And we have hundreds and hundreds more of you registered to watch along on YouTube. It's so great to have you all here. Today, our students are representing Canada, India, Ireland, Romania, the United Kingdom, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maine, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Mississippi, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, Vermont, Washington and West Virginia, and probably more places too. So if I happened to miss your country or your state, please let us know in the YouTube chat bar. I would love to say hi and give you a shout out. But for now, I think that is plenty of introduction from me. I think it's time to meet Phoebe and do some little interactions. So hi everyone, I'm Phoebe. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Celeste. So. I'm a crocodile conservationist and um, I work here. You might see uh, behind me um, in my video, this is a photo taken on the Narayani River in Nepal, um, where I'd love to be right now, but at the moment I'm currently stuck in the UK. Um, so yeah, so first up, we're gonna do uh, an interactive um, session, which I think Celeste's gonna help me with. Um, Absolutely. So I'm gonna share my screen now so that you can see this interactive that we're gonna run. Um, go ahead and if you're watching along, wherever you may be, on your phone or in another window on this same device, pull up menti.com, www.menti.com. It's gonna ask you when you get there to type in a number. That number to participate in this interaction is 23 0868. And if you forget any of those instructions, they're posted on the screen right now at the top in little letters. So all of that's on there. But the question we're working with today is what do you think when we say crocodile? What words come to your mind? You can submit four words at a time as many times as you'd like. Get in there and tell us what comes to mind. So far we've got scary and green and teeth, and dangerous, and swimming, and swamps, and scales. Phoebe, is this about what you were expecting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, these are great. This is, yeah. Well, oh, teeth. Teeth is coming up big. Gross. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, hopefully I can change your mind. Oh, we've got some cool, cold-blooded. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing, wild snouts. Adorable hatchlings. Dangerous is staying pretty big. A lot of you guys think they're dangerous. Slimy is up there now. Ooh. Well, 13 of you are doing great submitting. Um, and you can continue to submit, but I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing for now and let Phoebe take it away with more presentation. Awesome. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, there we go. So hopefully what you guys can see is something called a gurriel. So um, this is a gurriel and this is what I work on. So when someone says the word crocodile to me, 
this is what I think of straight away. Um, as you can see, it looks a lot like what you might think of when someone says crocodile or alligator, except it's got this really long, thin snout, which is pretty strange. And I mean, to be honest, it makes it look pretty bizarre. And then the other thing you'll notice is you've got this big adult gurriel and sitting on her head here are some of her babies. And so one of the important thing about gurriel and other crocodiles and alligators is they're really good parents. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit more in a minute. But first I'm gonna start with a question, which is thinking, what exactly is a gurriel? So obviously it looks kind of like what people think of when they say crocodile, except for, of course for this really long snout with these thin sharp teeth. And so a gurriel, is a crocodilian. So a crocodilian is a family of related animals that include the crocodiles, the alligators, the caimans, and the gurriel. And so they're kind of like, so humans are primates. So we're primates along with monkeys and orangutans and lemurs. In the same way, gurriels are crocodilians along with these other types that you get all over the world. Um, so you get Caymans um, in South and Central America, alligators in North America and China, and crocodiles get absolutely everywhere where it's warm and they've got rivers and swamps to live in. Um, and there are actually 26 different species of crocodilian. And they're not actually that closely related, but they all look fairly similar because they tend to have similar uh, places they live and ways of living. So they're adapted for the same environments. And my absolute favorites are the gurriel. And there's only two species of gurriel. And I've been very lucky to be able to meet both in the wild. Um, so here on the left, this is me holding a baby Thomas stoma, which is the type of gurriel that you get in Southeast Asia. And people know very little about these. These are probably the least well-known crocodilian. And before anyone asks, yes, I am wearing my pajamas in this photo. Um, it's the only time I've ever been past a crocodile in bed. Um, I was sleeping on a boat and I told the skipper how much I loved these, these gurriel. And so when he saw this little Thomas Stoma in the water, he grabbed it, brought it and gave it to me in bed, which is why I'm in my pajamas. And then on the right here, this is me holding a gurriel, or also known as the Indian gurriel. And that's the species I work on and what I'm going to talk to you about today. So where I work in Nepal, we get two types of crocodilian. And the first is the mugger crocodile that you can see here on the left. And they're definitely what people think of when you see a crocodile, you know, they're quite dangerous, a little bit scary, and they got this big fat head. And then the gurriel, these two are about the same size, but you can see that they've got this much longer, thinner snout that takes up a bigger proportion of their body. And this video shows that gurriel are really, really well adapted to a life spent living underwater in rivers. They have this long streamlined body and this big flattened tail at the back to propel themselves through the water. And you can see they've got these big webbed feet that they use to direct themselves. And they've got this thick protective um, skin on their backs to protect them from predators um, and also the sun. And then of course, the really distinctive thing that I just keep mentioning is the weird long snout. And the reason they've got this is they're specially adapted for eating fish. So because they've got this really long thin snout, they can move that really quickly through the water to catch swimming fish, which is most of their diet. But they do sometimes eat some other things. So you can see in this photo at the top, this one is crunching on a turtle. They will sometimes eat amphibians or crustaceans like crabs. When they're little, they eat insects and bugs. Um, but the key thing about gurriel is they're not actually very dangerous to people. You know, they never attack people. Um, or they definitely never eat people. And occasionally when there's been reports of someone being bitten by one, this gurriel has quickly let go when they've realized that they've taken a person, not a fish. And the other thing you might be thinking is what is wrong with this croc at the top? Cause it's got this weird lump on top of its nose. And that's in fact, the special thing about gurriels. So this lump tells us that it's an adult male and all adult male gurriel have this lump on the end of their nose. And it's called a gara, which is a word meaning a clay pot in Hindi, because it kind of looks a bit like a pot. And that's why they're called gurriel, because they have this lump. And this is really unique because it's only on the male, adult male gurriel, and it's only on gurriel. No other crocodilians have it. 
So here we can see a slightly closer up picture. This is actually quite a small one. They'd get even bigger than this on the big males. Um, and for a long time, people kind of wondered what this was all about. Uh, but recently, this is my friend Jai. So Jai's been studying acoustic communication in Gurriel. So what that means is he's studying the sounds they make and how they talk to each other. And what he's found is that the adult male Gurriel make a really unique sound called a pop. So I'm gonna play the sound. I don't know if you guys caught that, so I'll play it once more, listen carefully. And it's a really weird noise um, and you can hear it so far away, like a whole kilometer away. So the equivalent of standing 10 football pitches away. This is a really loud noise and the males use this for communicating with the females when they're flirting, communicating with other males when they're getting aggressive and trying to get them to clear off their turf. Um, they use it to communicate with their babies and occasionally they use it to show surprise when some weird zoologist turns up at the edge of their river. And what Jai's found is that only the adult males can make this sound. And if their gar gets knocked off, they stop being able to make it. So this seems to be some sort of amplifier that's really important basically, so these, these gurriel can have conversations. Um, so that's why they've got this weird lump, we think, currently. And the thing about gurriel is they get really big. They can get actually over six meters long. Um, so this photo here shows, this is a one meter stick, so shows just how big this gurriel is in comparison. And this little yellow stick is 30 centimeters, so about the size of a kind of school size ruler. And that's how big they are when they hatch. And just to show you that, here in the corner is one of the babies hanging out with dad. And so you can just see what, when they're born, they have so much growing to go before they're gonna become these huge kings of the river. And the reason the baby's hanging out with the male here is because they're really great parents. So here we have a male gurriel looking after a whole crush of baby gurriel. And because the females lay their nests all together and then they hatch at the same time. And so maybe a male, or almost certainly a few females stay and look after the babies for several weeks after they're born. Because when they're this small, they're really tasty to loads of predators and everything from fish to birds are gonna try and eat them. But they're definitely not if there's a six meter dad around. But the other cool thing is he might not actually be their father. He might be stepdad and he's just stepping in and looking after them. Um, and they found in India that um, they got quite a lot of young males doing this parenting duty, even though they haven't mated yet. And that might be a sort of investment for the future, um, because if the females know they're going to be a good dad, they might have better chances with the females next year. And so here are some of the babies up close. They're really floaty when they're little. I'm not sure that's a scientific term, but they really bob in the water. And you can see how they do that with their flattened body and with these big webbed feet. And also if you've ever wondered where a crocodile's ear is, you can see it nicely here. It's a little ear from this guy listening to me. So the reason I'm so interested in researching about gurriels is because they're critically endangered. Um, and that means they're at really immediate risk of extinction if we don't actively conserve them. And it's a really real worry that gurriel could go extinct in our lifetimes if we don't do everything in our power to protect them. And the reason they are so critically endangered is a number of threats and probably the most important one are uh, dams and barrages. So this is when there's human built structures like this one here that are built across rivers to control the water flow. And what happens is when they're built, they chop up the river into little sections. So that's really reducing the amount of habitat available to the gurriel. It's chopping up their home and it prevents them moving up and down stream. And this is not just a problem for gurriel. It's also a big problem for species like river dolphins and migratory fish. Another problem for gurriel is getting caught in fishing nets. So a lot of the time they get caught in fishing nets and they can't get out and either they can drown or sometimes people kill them when they're removing them from the nets. So that's a particularly big problem where I'm working in Nepal at the moment. 
And then an emerging issue, which is a huge issue for river conservationists worldwide at the moment, is sand and gravel mining. So this is the mining of sand and gravel from the river banks and beds uh, for the building industry. So getting building construction material for making roads and concrete. Um, and what happens is this can churn up the river banks that the gurriel need to bask on and they need to lay their eggs in. But it can also affect the whole dynamic of the river, both for the wildlife in the river and of course, for the local communities who also rely on the river and fresh water. So this is a map that shows where gurriel used to occur. So if we go back to the 1940s, you've got gurriel in Pakistan, all of northern India and southern Nepal, through to Bangladesh and Bhutan, and possibly even as far east as Myanmar. But unfortunately, the populations crashed and they're now 96% reduced. So only 4% of the gurriels that were around in the 1940s are still around today. And then just 14 really isolated locations in northern India and Nepal. And I work in an area called Chitwan, which is the biggest population left in Nepal. And there's about 230 gurriel in that population. So it's a really tiny number but luckily it is slowly increasing. And one of my big questions is how much river do we need to protect to save gurriel? I mentioned earlier that building these dams is kind of breaking the rivers into sections. And we know we have to really well protect certain stretches of river so that the babies are safe, so they don't get tangled in nets. And we don't know currently in Nepal, how much of the river a single gurriel needs. We know we find them over about 100 kilometers, but is this one gurriel going from all the way at the top of the river to the bottom? Um, and so this is, this is a really vital question for conservationists. And the way to investigate this is using something called radio telemetry. And so the first step in our project um, was catching wild gurriel. So this is my awesome team in Nepal. Um, these guys are all from the uh, indigenous Bote and Maji communities. And so they lived on these rivers their whole lives. And they taught me so much about the rivers and where to find gurriel. And so what we did is we caught the gurriel in nets because that's the uh, easiest and safest way to catch them. And so you can hear, see here a kind of action shot. Here's a gurriel in the middle. The team have set a net around the beach that the gurriel is hopefully gonna swim into. And if not, these guys have throw nets and they're really experienced and they catch the gurriel in the throw nets. And as soon as we've caught her, we'll take her onto the shore. And the first thing we do is blindfold her. That's really important for keeping her calm and making her feel safe. We cover her eyes and then you can see I'm sitting on her and that's actually quite important for keeping pressure on her so she doesn't move too much and cause any risk to herself or to the team. And so what we then do is we put wet sacks on her. So she's, she's cool and damp and she kind of feels like she's back underwater. Um, and then very quickly, we attach these radio tags to the tail. And basically what these tags do is we can follow up for two years the position of this gurriel. So even if we can't see her, even if she's underwater, we know where she is. Um, and very importantly, we can tell her apart from other gurriel. So, they're quite hard to tell apart in photos, but if we know which tag number she is, we can specifically tell exactly where she's moving in the river. So after we put the tags on, we release the gurriel straight back into the river where we caught them. So you can see here the team we're prepping to release. Um, and the key thing is to leave the blindfold on right up until the last minute, because even though gurriel aren't dangerous to people, they still have really, really sharp teeth. So you don't want them to give you a head swipe in the leg as a sort of parting blow as they head off. So we always put a stick by her head so that when she's going back into the water, if she does turn the wrong way, she hits the stick and then knows to go the other way back into the river. Um, and so here we have one of the girls going back off into the river with her shiny new tag. And then we mostly follow them up manually. So this is an antenna. And so we go up and down the river sort of two to three times a week, trying to see exactly where the gurriel are. Um, so usually we do this by going to the bridges, going along the roadside on a motorbike and locating exactly where they are in the river. Sometimes we can't see them because they're underwater, but we know where they are. 
Uh, sometimes they decide to go to bits of the river where there are no roads, and then we have to head off in a boat to try and find them. So this in the middle is uh, Prakash. So Prakash is my awesome team member who I completely rely on because he's out in Nepal at the moment, continuing to do the tracking. Um, and you can see him here in one of the really big rivers in the south of Nepal, um, looking for, this was one of our missing Guriel. She's turned up just after this photo was taken. So a lot of it is this really hands-on going in the field and locating exactly where the crops are, um, which is a great way to do it because it means you can see what else is going on at the same time. What other species are there? What are people doing? Why might the gurriel be in this area and not that area? Um, and what we found is that some of the gurriel move really long distances. So this arrow shows one female we tagged here around Christmas time. And in the spring, she traveled 40 kilometers downstream in order to find a male gurriel to mate with. And that's where she, where she laid her nest. So we're just waiting to see whether she comes back up for the winter. It's quite exciting. Um, and then this female, this is the whole catch team here with our biggest female. So she was four meters long. It took all 10 of us to get her out the water because she was so heavy. Um, so we knew she was probably a really important mama. And we were right because we followed her up. And this photo was her a few weeks ago being the, the main guardian female looking after all the baby gurriels of 15 different females. Um, and a really important question for conservationists is, are the gurriel in Nepal, are they breeding? Are they having babies every year or every other year? And if we can answer that question, it can help us predict how quickly the gurriel population might increase and recover. And in India, we know they breed every year. Uh, in Nepal, we're not sure, but we know which females bred this year. So by this time next year, I'll hopefully have the answer to that question. Um, and then I want to end with uh, this video, just showing some of the babies swimming in their, in their habitat in the river uh, that just fills me with a lot of hope. There's some really awesome Indian and Nepalese conservationists working to protect this species and lots of local communities engaging and prioritizing the conservation of these gurriel. Um, and as we see more and more nests hatching every year, I'm optimistic that if we all continue to work for and prioritize gurriel conservation, then hopefully they will still be in the rivers when, well, when I'm old and perhaps when some of you have become mature conservationists yourselves. So thank you for listening. Phoebe, this is so cool and absolutely amazing. I think we've definitely challenged the idea that crocs are just green and scaly and dangerous, but why don't we check that assumption? I'm gonna send you guys back to menti.com. We're gonna drop some instructions for you in the chat bar. What do you think of when we say crocodile now? Go ahead and add your thoughts. They'll pop up here on the screen. Save them is definitely new from last time. What else do you see, Phoebe? Uh, save them's awesome. I love Jaguar. I'm guessing that's someone who's seen the amazing footage of a Jaguar killing a caiman, um, which is actually, and in Nepal, we found that tigers will sometimes will be one of the only predators of some of the bigger gurriel. Um, so that's a bit of a conflict there because I'm all about the saving the gurriel, not the tigers but tigers are pretty cool too. Good to humans. Yeah, I love that. I think they're gorgeous. This is a fun one. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think they're really gorgeous. And saltwater crocodiles, they're pretty cool. They're the biggest and baddest crocodiles probably. Cute, yeah, definitely cute. We've got some good parents and endangered coming in on the YouTube chat bar. Someone also suggested Godzilla. So that's good. Cute babies is popping up everywhere. Go ahead and keep filling this uh, this um, Menti board with all of your thoughts. I can't wait to see that, that word cloud continue to grow. But also start sending us your questions. It is now question time. It's our favorite time of the day. You only need to send each question one time. We record absolutely everything you send into us. Um, so please don't spam us. If you do, we'll put you in timeout. Students up on screen with me, get your nice loud voices ready. I'll let you know when it's your turn. And Phoebe, your first question of the day comes to us from Matthew, who's wondering how long these live. Oh, it's a very good question. 
Um, and the answer is we're not entirely sure um, because it's um, there haven't been many in captivity for a, a long time. It's it's difficult to say how long some of them are going to live. Um, and in the wild, it's hard to know how old they are. But it's estimated they can probably live 60 to 70 years. Um, seems fairly reasonable. So uh, some people say they can live longer. Um, but I guess we just have to wait it out for see how long the ones in captivity live. That's amazing. And then Peyton is wondering how long you personally have been studying them. So I've personally been studying Gurriel now for three years. Awesome. And I think it's about time we visit an on-screen group. Let's go to the SEBA crew. What's your first question for Phoebe? Um, uh, is the Grail one of the relatives of Spinosaurus? It's because I've seen some photos, but they think he, people that see Spinosaurus kind of swimming, kind of like a crocodile and moving, and it has that snout. I've yeah, so... Um, crocodiles and all dinosaurs are related, um, but in fact, they're, they're not sort of directly related. So the ancestors of crocodiles lived at the same time as dinosaurs, um, and a lot of them would have lived in the same environment. So because they're both reptiles, when some of the dinosaurs were uh, adapted for um, living in swamps and rivers, they'd have probably shown a lot of the same features as um, crocodiles, maybe including the way they swim. Um, and, but in fact, yeah, so the closest relatives to dinosaurs would be the birds today. Um, and the crocodiles are kind of this other branch. So they're just as old as the dinosaurs. Um, and actually, previously, there were loads more species and different types of crocodiles. So they were way more varied. Um, in the past, but we've only got 26 species left today. All right. Well, we've got Ben, who's watching from Wales, who's wondering what the strangest thing you've seen a gharial do is. Ooh, the strangest thing I've seen a gharial do. Well, I'm going to say it's the strangest thing. It was something a baby gharial did. So you see the pictures I put up of the crocodiles, the mugger crocodiles. They are definitely known for eating baby gharial. Um, but actually this year, what we've seen is some of the baby gharial went and joined a mummy mugger and her babies. And ever since she's just, that mummy mugger has been protecting the baby gharial and she's been sitting on her head um, and staying with that crocodile just like she would her own gharial mum. Um, so I think that's pretty strange, but quite cool. Love it. Well, let's see what Elise and Sophie's question is. My question was, are there any predators that eat crocodile, crocodiles, especially that they're dangerous? Yeah, absolutely. So it depends on the size of the crocodile. So if you get a baby crocodile, absolutely everything eats them. Like, and I mean everything. So they get eaten by other crocodiles. They get eaten by big fish and birds and wild pigs and wild dogs. Um, but the bigger and bigger they get, the safer and safer they are. Um, so by the time they kind of get towards two meters long, there's not much that could eat them other than other bigger crocodiles and alligators. So they can be cannibals. Um, so they might eat smaller ones. Um, and then with the bigger size ones, you actually, there are some predations such as um, jaguars can kill caimans in South America. And we have one report of tigers killing adult gharial in Nepal. But by the time you get to a really big gharial that's like six meters or a really big saltwater crocodile, there's absolutely nothing that would kill one other than of course humans are probably the biggest threat because nearly all croc species came very close to going extinct back in the 1950s and 60s um, after people decided to hunt them. Um, and it's thanks to really great conservation that they are now safe from the dangers of people. Speaking of that really great conservation, we've got Catherine in the chat bar who's wondering if there are any plans to reintroduce them to historic territories. Yeah, great question. Um, there absolutely are. Um, so 
the other half of my research that I didn't get a chance to talk about today was uh, looking at reintroductions of gurriel. Um, mostly in this case, they're reintroducing them uh, to try and boost their numbers um, in Chitwan, where I'm working in Nepal. Um, and it's quite tricky to do. Um, usually a lot of them don't survive the process of being released. Um, and so historically, they've tried to reintroduce them to quite a few sites in Nepal and India, and it's generally not worked. However, recently, an initiative in Hastinapur in India has successfully reintroduced them to a new sanctuary, uh, which is really exciting. So they released uh, juvenile animals. So they're currently just waiting to see if they're going to grow up, become adults and start breeding there. So there's definitely the potential. Um, for more reintroductions in the future. And I know that there's uh, talk about reintroducing them to countries where they're extinct, like Pakistan, Bhutan, and Bangladesh. So cool. Let's take a question from Anian and Tille. Go for it, folks. Um, speaking of uh, gharial predators, um, so when a gharial gets in a conflict with a, a mugger crocodile or a tiger or saltwater crocodile, who usually wins? I'm the salty one is pretty obvious. But... That's a very good question. Well, I feel like a salty would win, but you don't get them in the same rivers. Um, so it never has not really happened, but you do get salties in the same uh, rivers as the Tomistoma, the other gurriel, or for example, the freshwater crocodile in Australia. And then the salty always wins. Um, with Between a mugger and a gurriel, um, we've seen a lot of these interactions and it's kind of size dependent. So the big muggers do kill small gurriel, but once they kind of get to similar sizes, then they do these threat displays to each other. So they make these sort of low noises, kind of like growling at each other and they lift their backs up. Um, and if it comes in to doing these sort of threat displays, usually the gurriels win out because the gurriels can get over six meters long, whereas the muggers only get to about four meters. Um, so the big gurriels are really chunky and the muggers not gonna take their chances. We've got two questions in the chat bar about where gurriels can live. So one person in California is wondering what the nearest gurriel to them is. And another person watching in India, in Southern India is wondering if they've ever lived that far south. Awesome questions. So um, I'm afraid there are none near California, but I know there are some in some zoos around the US. Um, um, historically, you did get species of gurriel across most of Asia, and I believe they found some in Africa, but now they're just in the Indian subcontinent and today just in India and Nepal. Um, and thinking about them in terms of the south of India, um, so they've never been right down in the south. They've always been sort of restricted to the north. Um, oh, I can't remember. They kind of, there are some river systems where there are some gurial reports um, from about 100 years ago, getting down to kind of central India, um, but, but never quite. So my friend Jai, who I talked about, he's from, he's from really far south India. Um, and so... He, he comes up to study them in North India because you don't get them down there. Awesome. Well, let's see what questions Andrew has. Um, my question is, what made you want to study Gurriel? A great question. What made me want to study Gurriel? Um, so when I was a kid, I grew up in Nepal. Um, and I was very lucky to be able to go down to um, the south of Nepal and I saw gurriel in the wild and in a breeding center there. And I heard about um, a conservationist called Dr. Tirthaman Maske, who's a Nepalese conservationist who did his PhD on gurriel in the 80s. And I heard about all this amazing and awesome conservation work they'd done in Nepal that had meant that the gurriel hadn't gone extinct. And then, when I was older and I'd studied and trained to become a conservation biologist, um, I heard that the gurriel was still having some trouble and they needed some scientific research in order to understand why that was. Um, 
And this was seemed like an amazing opportunity for me because I've always loved them since I was a kid, but I thought that they kind of the whole problem was sorted and they were going to completely recover. Um, so yeah, but I've just always loved crocodiles. I love rivers and I love anything with big teeth that lives in rivers. Um, so for me, it was definitely a no brainer. I was going to end up working with, uh, with some sort of crocodile. Awesome. We've got Harry in the chat bar on YouTube who's wondering what other wildlife you encounter when you're out in the field looking for gharials. Oh, um, I'm very lucky to encounter some really cool wildlife. Uh, so my favorite thing is the um, Asiatic river dolphin. So we get these incredible river dolphins and they're basically blind and they live in the same habitats as the gharial. Uh, but we also come across tigers. Um, we get uh, a lot of tigers wandering up and down the rivers, um, sometimes having a look at the baby gharial. Um, loads of rhinos um, and wild elephants. Actually, the biggest danger we have to think about when we're doing field work is always knowing where the wild elephants and the rhinos are. And I actually spend quite a lot of time running away from wild elephants when we end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. That seems like a very smart thing to do when you encounter an elephant. Let's visit the Seba crew again. Go for it, folks. What's your next question? What did you want to ask? What's my uh, gharial egg look like? Okay, get big and loud. What does a gharial egg look like? Oh, sorry, I missed that. What does the egg look like? The egg. Okay, so gharial eggs um, are actually the biggest crocodilian egg. Um, and so they kind of look something like a, I guess a bit like a chicken egg, but way bigger. And they're really white. But the thing is, they're not hard like a chicken egg. They kind of have this soft leathery shell. And when the baby gharials inside, they have this egg tooth, like all crocodilians, that they use to rip open this leathery um, eggshell and, and get out. And um, the mums help kick them out the nests. Um, most crocodiles pick up the babies in their jaws and help sort of take the, the shells off. But because the gharial are these really weird long thin snouts, they can't do that. So generally they just kind of help kick them out the eggs. Um, and sometimes we as conservationists find that the mums forget the odd nest. And so then we have to dig them out and help peel open the little shells. So cool. And when you peel open the little shells, do you ever name the crocs that you work with? We've got Sydney wondering. Um, so I, I'm really boring. And usually I name the crocodile the number they have the, on their radio. So um, they're usually called Gurriel 18 or Gurriel 30. Um, I have given a couple of them names. Our really big female, I showed you the photo of, we call her Big Mama. Um, and, um, but yeah, um, I haven't named any of the ones we've helped hatch from the eggs um, because once we've released them again, we just can't tell which one's which. That makes sense. Let's go back to Elise and Sophie for another question. My question is, what is the most significant difference in the lifespan between crocodiles and alligators? Oh, it's a really good question. Um, and you know what? I don't think I really know the answer, but I imagine they're pretty similar. I imagine that both live a kind of fairly similar lifespan to uh, the gharial, which is about 60 to 70 years. Awesome. And speaking of how they live, we've got Molly who wants to know where they sleep. Do they sleep in a nest? What is that like? How big is it? Yeah. So where, where do gharials sleep? So um, they can sleep when they're um, basking on the riverbank. Um, so they, when it's warm and sunny, they lie on the riverbanks in order to soak up the sun. Um, but they can also they could also sleep floating in the water or if they were underwater as well, um, they can actually stay underwater a really, really long time by slowing their heart rate right down. And they kind of just, they just sit on the bottom, um, which is easier to see in captivity. Um, but sometimes the water in Nepal gets really, really crystal clear um, in about February time. And you can see them just kind of dozing on the bottom, not doing anything. 
So cool. Well, let's go back to Anian and Chile. They've got another question. And say who wins tiger in the tiger. Are there any um, videos of tiger and gharial conflicts? If so, can you um, say the name of the link? Um, I'm afraid not. So the only one report we have um, comes from my friend who's a conservationist called D.B. Chowdhury. Uh, and he, 19 years ago, um, he's the only person to have seen this tiger gharial conflict. Um, and he saw the gharial was just sleeping on the bank and the tiger just came out of the forest and grabbed it. Um, but she was a female, so she was gravid, which means like pregnant, but full of eggs. Um, and what they found the next day was all the eggs had rolled out when the tiger had eaten the gharial and were all over the forest floor, um, which is pretty crazy. Um, but that's the only report we have and no one's ever caught it on film. Wow. All right, well, we've got Sandra with a very different question who's wondering when the babies go off on their own and how big they are when that happens. Yeah, so the babies um, hatch just before monsoon season, which is the rainy season. And the mums and occasionally the dad will stay with them right up until the start of monsoon season. So that's kind of bef between four and eight weeks, um, in which time they start to grow really quickly. So when they're about three weeks old, they start catching fish. Um, so when they're teeny tiny, they're already catching fish. Um, and so they're not that much bigger, um, only kind of this sort of size when the parents head off um, for feeding because the monsoon's the best time for the adults to eat fish. Um, but although they don't stay specifically with their parents, they do somewhat associate with the adults still. Um, particularly in India, they've seen that these big adult males will still check up on the yearlings. So when he's doing his rounds, they kind of do these rounds when they're um, in breeding season, checking on the females. But they'll also go up to the yearlings and interact with them. Um, and so unlike some other crocodilian species that become aggressive to their babies in the future, Gurry will never do that. So um, you'll often see these big groups of Gurry basking together of all mixed ages. So ones that are only a year or two old through to ones that must be more than 50. Awesome. Well, we've got one more student up here on screen with us. Robert's microphone isn't working. So I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight their video. And we've got a question of how many teeth your gharials have? Oh, that's a really good question. So they have between 106 and 110 teeth. Um, and they're really, really sharp and they keep replacing them throughout their lives. Um, it's because it's so important for crocs to have these, these teeth because um, that's how they catch all their prey. And so um, as each tooth falls out, there's another one waiting behind it, ready to push up and through. Um, so they keep a lot of teeth um, throughout their lives. And I can assure you they are very sharp. <laughs> I believe it. They look really, really sharp. Well, we've got a really important question in the chat bar from Rika S, who is wondering uh, what they can do to help save endangered species like gharials. That's a, a really great question. Um, there's things that um, all of us can do at home. Um, so freshwater environments are the most endangered environments in the world um, in, in so many countries, not just where we get crocodiles, but um, in other countries, the fishes, turtles um, are often really, really endangered. So protecting fresh water is so important. And so there are lots of different ways um, that we can uh, make everyday changes to help protect rivers. Um, so one of the most important ones is to eat less meat um, because meat production takes up a lot of fresh water. Um, so a cool initiative is Meat Free Mondays um, where people don't eat meat on Mondays and that ha helps save a lot of water. Also using refillable bottles um, that you refill from tap water if that's safe where you live so that um, you're not throwing away um, trash. Um, and also just really respecting rivers. Most of us live near rivers of some sort. So making sure you don't put any litter in them. Um, and also never feeding animals that live in the river. Um, that's definitely important if any of you are living somewhere where there are crocs, never ever feed wild crocs. It's really dangerous. But it's also true of a lot of other wildlife. Um, you can put them and other people at risk if you feed wildlife. Um, so yeah, those are just a kind of a couple of changes. 
Um, and also just, just prioritizing, um, you know, endangered species, talking to people, starting conversations. Um, so many people who support and help in conservation um, and who are really instrumental are just people who got inspired after hearing about endangered species from someone else. Um, so yeah, just share your love of endangered species and you can really make people think about the environment. That's so awesome. And Phoebe, do you have any general advice for all the young explorers out there watching? Yeah, um, so um, I would definitely say for anyone who loves wildlife and conservation that this is something everyone can get involved in. Um, whether that's kind of just from an interest side um, or whether you want to become a conservationist um, or a zoologist as your career. Um, I just want to say this is something that's it's a it's kind of it's all teamwork and so the more people who are involved from the more diverse backgrounds and choices in life then the better we can succeed um so yeah i kind of uh say that everyone um should really think about conservation and definitely um definitely engage where you can so cool well, thank you so much, Phoebe. And for everyone out there watching, you can check out Explore Classroom as well as many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. And please share your work with us on Twitter. If you do a follow-up activity from the Family Guide, maybe you draw a picture, write a story, or maybe you go out and investigate your own wildlife and protect your own watersheds. Whatever it is, send it to us by tagging at natgeoeducation and using hashtag Explore Classroom on Twitter. That way we can make sure Phoebe gets the chance to see all of your amazing work too. You can tune back in tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can even bookmark this page so it's even easier for you to come back. And now, right before we sign off, I wanna make sure that everybody gets a chance to get nice and loud. You've all been so patient and such, such studious, studious participants. Let's turn on everyone's microphones and nice and loud, let's say goodbye and thank you to Phoebe. Ready? Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you.